Let us read what Philip just sang. Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. As we continue the vision that John saw standing at heaven's door. Revelation chapter 5, we're beginning reading in verse 1. And I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book, written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. And I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And he came and took it out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, having each one a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals. For you were slain and did purchase for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. And I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them, I heard saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for this passage of Scripture, for this glimpse of Jesus' glory, of His enthronement. And we are thankful for how this encourages us and strengthens us. Father, as I asked you earlier, I ask again that you would open the hearts of everyone in this room I don't know the situations and I don't know the hurts and the pains and the fears and the trials that's going on in this room even now, but you do. And I pray that by your Spirit you would apply your word to each individual heart. And where there is discouragement and fear, Lord, I pray that hope would overcome. Where there is compromise, an unrepentant sin, I pray that conviction would overcome. Where there is discouragement, I pray that you would encourage. Lord, I pray that you would flood our hearts with hope this morning. I pray that you would remind us of your great love and your great power and your great mercy and your great sovereignty this morning. I pray that you would change the way we see you through your word today. And I pray that you would change the way that we live our lives by the renewing of our minds this morning. Please, Father, help us. Help us with your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A child who touches a hot stove will learn from the pain he experiences in that moment to avoid the stove in the future. My neighbor has a dog with a, one of those collars around its neck so that if he gets to a certain point in the yard, it sends a jolt into the dog in order to keep the dog inside the buried fence. In each of these situations, it's similar to the situation that you might find yourself in when you've 
had your heart broken by someone. And you're a little bit more hesitant to open up and, and make yourself vulnerable again. Why is it that we become so protective? Why is it that we become so standoffish? It's because of pain. We don't like pain. We don't want to experience pain despite the fact that pain in some ways is a gift of grace. Because the pain is sending a signal to the body that protect yourself. You're, you're being injured. You're being hurt somehow. You need to protect yourself. And so because of a fear of pain, whether it's a previously experienced pain or perhaps an imagined pain that might come if this takes place, we oftentimes are paralyzed into inaction. We become so traumatized by the possibility of pain that we are unwilling to be faithful to the commission and to the call of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's this fear of pain that prevents us from faithfully witnessing to our neighbors and our friends and our co-workers, our family members. We fear a broken relationship. We fear awkward and irreversible walls being constructed between you and someone else. We fear that the friendship will never be the same. We fear rejection. We fear humiliation. We fear the loss of reputation. We fear the loss of status within the community. For some of us, we fear a lawsuit. For those of us, we refuse to go on missions. We're happy to send our money overseas, but we ourselves have never gone on a mission trip. And if we were honest with ourselves, one of the biggest reasons why is because of fear of something happening while we're there. We feel pretty safe in America, but if you go to Africa or you go to India where there is hostility to the gospel, could we be persecuted? And that fear of what might be inhibits us. The pain that we all fear is the pain that this ancient churches were fearing as well. They were wavering with compromise. They were afraid of the possibility of pain, whether it was financial ruin because they would not go to the, the trade guild festivals and offer sacrifices to the local patron deities. And as a result, they were no longer allowed to ply their trade in the city. And so they feared financial ruin for standing faithful to Jesus Christ. They feared imprisonment. They feared torture. They feared beatings. They feared jail. They feared, feared execution because they refused to acknowledge that Caesar was Lord. They said Jesus is Lord. But for some of them, this fear of what might be was causing them to take a step back and compromise. And they were praying for Caesar, acting the part, but saying in their hearts, we don't really mean these prayers. And it is to this situation that the book of Revelation has been written. To believers in danger of compromise. In danger of compromise because of fear. And to this church, Jesus says it over and over and over again, you must overcome. You must conquer your fear. You must overcome and endure into the end. No matter what it costs you, no matter what happens, you must overcome. I mean, just listen to the words that he says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone which no one knows but he who receives it. And he who overcomes, and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. He who overcomes shall, not, shall thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life. And I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels." He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it anymore, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Jesus is telling the church, you must overcome. If you would inherit New Jerusalem, 
If you would have your name inscribed upon a white stone, if you would have your name permanently inscribed in the book of life, you must be one who overcomes. You must remain loyal to Jesus. You must talk of Jesus. You must declare Jesus. You cannot hide that. It was Jesus himself said that if you are ashamed of him in this adulterous and sinful generation, he will be ashamed of you before his father. We must overcome. We must overcome our fears. But he doesn't just tell us to overcome and leave it at that. No, our loving God is so gracious that he gives us a word to strengthen us to move us, to motivate us, to drive us with joy to overcome. See, we do not overcome out of duty. We do not overcome because we have to, because God is such a slave driver. No, 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 no. God is calling us to joy. And it is in that joy, in that knowledge, in that hope, in that, in that satisfaction in Christ that we overcome. And so as we look at this text this morning, we see four images that are designed to encourage the weary follower of Christ to keep witnessing and to keep praying despite their afflictions. He's calling us to faithfulness. He's calling us to overcome. But he calls us by motivating us with such exquisite visions that we cannot possibly stand here and see what John sees and not be moved by it. So look at the text with me again as we see four images. Four times in the text, John says, I saw. He says, I saw a book in verse 1. He saw a strong angel proclaiming in verse 2. He sees the lamb slaughtered as if slain in verse 6. And he sees thousands and thousands and thousands beyond count angels singing the praises of God. And in each of these visions, we should come away encouraged, strengthened with hope, strengthened with joy, strengthened with wonder at the great God of heaven and earth who has saved us. Look with me at the sealed book of God's final plan. Verse 1, he says, I saw in the right hand of him who sat upon the throne a book written inside and on the back sealed up with seven seals. The first thing he sees, he draws our attention to in the midst of this whole panorama of glory and splendor and light and flashing lightning and thunder and peals, all of these things, his attention is directed to a book. And the book is written on the inside and on the outside and the book is sealed up with seven seals. So what is this book? Look at Daniel chapter 7. As you remember from our study in chapter 4, that Revelation 4 and 5 are really an expansion of Daniel 7. There are 14 points of similarity that the, the flow of the text is very similar in both of these texts. And what we're seeing here is Daniel expanding, or John expanding on Daniel, bringing in more detail, bringing in more clarity for us. He's focusing the lens so that we can see a bit more clearly. And in verse 10, we see the throne of God. A river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him. Myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat and what happened? The books were open. Now what happens when the books are opened? In verse 11, verse 11 is Revelation 6 through 18 compressed into one verse. Then I kept looking because of the sound of the boastful words which the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body was destroyed and given to burning with fire. The judgment of God is unleashed upon the beast who is animated by Satan. The judgment of God is unleashed upon this world system of rebellion against God. The judgment of God is unleashed upon the unrepentant and reviling of this world who refuse to acknowledge Jesus as Lord. And their end is final. 
They are destroyed. And we're going to see this un, unfurled before us in great detail in the weeks to come. But it's then at this point that the kingdom is given over to Jesus. Jesus receives authority to exact and execute this judgment. Now look over to Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. But as for you, Daniel, conceal these words and seal up the book until the end of time. Many will go back and forth and knowledge will increase. In verse 9, go your way, Daniel, for these words are concealed and sealed up until the end of time. There is much to talk about regarding the end of the world, regarding the, the final cataclysmic determinative judgment of God. When he brings wickedness to an end, when he scours the world clean, cleansing it once and for all, so that we may dwell in newness where there is no more sin and no more suffering and no more pain and no more death. All of this is to take place. But Daniel is called to seal up the book. Conceal it. It's not time yet to, to unfurl this divine plan. Other things must take place first. But now... What we see in Revelation 5 is the time is at hand. And the book is laying there ready to be opened. And when the book is opened, not only do we see what is about to happen, but rather what is about to happen is unleashed and executed. You see, another image that is behind this book is the idea of the Roman will and testament. One commentator named G.K. Beale indicates there's four similarities between this book in Revelation 5 and the, and, the, and the will in the Roman world. Number one, the contents of the will were sometimes summarized on the back. This book is written on the inside and on the back. Number two, it had to be witnessed and sealed by seven witnesses. There are seven seals on this book. It is witnessed, it is closed, it is concealed. Seven witnesses bearing fact of this. Number three, only on the death of the tester could the will be unsealed and the legal promise of the inheritance executed. Who do we see before the book is opened? The lamb as if slain. And he is worthy. No one else is worthy. Why? Because he died. In verse, or in, and rather, number four, a trustworthy executor would then put the will into legal effect. He would execute the plan. He would he would send it out. He would enact the plan. And this is exactly what Jesus does. When he receives the book into his right hand, and when he takes the book from God the Father, every one of the living creatures, all of the angels, the elders, they all fall down and worship him because they recognize what? That authority from God has been handed over to the Son. The Lamb now has the authority of God to send forth the judgment of God upon the wicked and to redeem and rescue His beloved. It's what we see in John chapter 5. Look at John's Gospel chapter 5. Verse 22. For not even the Father judges anyone, but He has given all judgment to the Son in order that all may honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent Him. All judgment, all authority, all power, all dominion has been given to the Lamb. This book is the book of God's plan. You, you see, we don't live in a world governed by chance. We don't live in a world where the future is uncertain and unknown. We live in the midst of a world that is being directed and orchestrated by the sovereign hand of a good and loving God. A God who is working all things together for our good. Who causes all things, bad, horrible things that we would say in our lives, He causes even those things to be servants of the good that He is doing in our lives. We are not at the whim of Satan. We are not at the whim and mercy of evil men and women in this world. No, 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 no. God is on the throne. 
And the book of history, the book of his plan, how everything is going to end and come to a climax and come to a conclusion before he unleashes eternity in which there is no wickedness and sin, all of that is right here in this book. God is about to unleash the end. And it will happen just as he declared it millennia before. That's what this book is. Now, look at the second thing John sees. Look at the only worthy person who is able to open the book and to execute God's final plan. In verses 2 through 5, we see this. A strong angel begins to proclaim and declare with a loud voice who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals. And the, the answer is no one. No one in heaven, no one on earth, no one in the sea, no one under the earth, no one physical or spiritual in being, absolutely no one is worthy. As the angel sends forth this booming voice across the crystal sea, silence as no one steps forward. No angel, no demon, no human being, No saint, no king, no ruler, no beast, no animal, nothing, no one. And John begins to sob and weep. Why? Because if the book is not opened, if the seals aren't broken, then God's plan will not be enacted. His plan will not be executed. His will will not be unleashed. The saints will not be vindicated. Believers will not be resurrected. Satan will not be judged. Evil will continue to thrive and grow like a cancer in the world. Will there be no justice? Will there be no vindication? Will there be no resurrection of the redeemed? Will there be no end of Satan's schemes? Will there be no end of pain and suffering? And John weeps. And in that moment, it's almost as if you can see it, can't you? An elder reaches out and just kind of grabs him by the back of the neck. Stop it. Stop crying. Stop crying. The lion, look, the lion of Judah, the root of David has overcome so as to open the book and to break its seven seals. The lion of Judah. He's reaching all the way back into Genesis 49 when he said that Judah was like a lion's cub, that he would one day rule over all the others. He's reaching back into Isaiah 11 where it says that the Messiah, the servant of the Lord who's coming to save his people is actually the source of David, but also the son of David. He is not only David's Lord, he is David's son. He is the God-man who has come from heaven and become incarnate as human flesh in order to rule on David's throne forever and ever and ever. This individual has come and he has overcome. He has conquered the enemy. And now he has the authority to open the book and to finish the job. This is who he is. You see, the Messiah has triumphed over the powers of darkness. He has reversed the curse set upon the world because of sin. He has trampled sin to death. He has obliterated the power of sin to hold and enslave us in bondage. He has dragged the snake, the dragon, off of his usurped throne. And now he stands with his foot upon his wriggling neck. He has overcome and is now worthy to approach the Ancient of Days and to be given sovereign dominion over all that exists so that he can do with as he pleases the world. And what he pleases is to bless those whom he loves and to bring about vindication for them and rescue and deliverance and destroy the world of rebellion once and for all so that it can no longer harm his people or impinge upon his honor. We don't live in a world 
of maybe and possibility. We ruled in the world of the controlled and ruled by the sovereign hand of Jesus Christ. When you read Psalm 2 and you read Psalm 110 and you read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, what we're seeing is the triumphant Son of God who has been resurrected into life, who has ascended to the right hand of the Father and even now is exercising dominion and bringing everything underneath His authority. As the church is expanding, creating worshipers of God all across the globe, what is happening is that Jesus' authority is expanding and bringing every knee to bow to King Jesus. One day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that He is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And then on that day, the final enemy will be placed under His feet, death itself. It will be crushed to death. Our future is secure. Our future is secure. The one who loves us, the one who gave himself up for us, the one who is bringing us to God the Father is the one who rules over the world. We do not live at the mercy of Satan. We do not have to fear what man can do to us because King Jesus rules over all. And his kingdom, his authority is now being unleashed as he cracks the book and breaks the seals. What we are witnessing here is the enthronement of Christ. Now, how is it that he actually overcame? Look at the text. Look at the third image that John sees. He says, I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He sees a lamb. But not just any lamb. A lamb standing as if slain. Now we read a little bit further down in verse 9. He says, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals because you were slain and did purchase for God with your blood men from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. And you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. This lamb has overcome through suffering. This lamb has overcome by submitting himself to God in obedience even though it meant absorbing all of the hell and all of the wrath and all of the judgment of God on behalf of sinners. That's how he overcame. He overcame by submitting himself to humiliation and torture and death on a cross. He overcame through the midst of his suffering And because he did that, he went out and and not just attacked the, 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 the limbs off of the problem of sin. No, he went to the very root of sin and pulled it out so that nothing is left. His seven horns represent his authority and power. Seven being the number of completion, fullness, Horns usually, most often in the Old Testament, representing authority and power. He has full power. Seven eyes represent the Spirit of God. He is empowered by the Spirit to to be obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You see, these images are coming out of Zechariah 3, verses 8 and 9, and and Zechariah chapter 4, verses 6 through 10, where it says that in the day of this one, the iniquity of my people will be removed in one day. And it won't happen by might, and it won't happen by power. It will happen by my Spirit, says the Lord. This one who comes in the power of the Spirit of God lays himself down in sacrifice and in substitution for sinners. And in so doing, he absorbs the wrath of God on their behalf, and he redeems them, he ransoms them, he sets them free from their enslavement and bondage to sin. Scripture says he purchased for God these people. He takes control of history because of his work of redemption. See, what was happening here is Exodus language. When God came into Egypt, see, Pharaoh, the, 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 the theology of, of Egypt was that the Pharaoh was a living embodiment of a God. 
Pharaoh was a god. And the job of Pharaoh was to make sure all of Egypt maintained a prosperous life. It was Pharaoh who brought prosperity and blessing to the country so that they had food, they had riches, they had wealth, they had prosperity, they had protection, all of those things. It's interesting, as God marches in, who does he target? He targets Pharaoh. And he targets Pharaoh by upending everything Pharaoh is supposed to have control of. Every, every plague is demonstrating that Pharaoh cannot protect his people. But God alone is God. And he ransoms his people through the blood of the Passover lamb. He brings them out with signs and wonders. He crushes Pharaoh to death at the Red Sea. And now at Mount Sinai, God says these same words to his people. I have ransomed you. I've saved you. Now I'm making you into a kingdom of priests. What God is doing in Christ is what he did in Exodus. It's a new Exodus. What Exodus was a picture of, Jesus is the fulfillment of. He is marching into Satan's kingdom and he is grabbing Satan by the throat and he has thrown him down and he has destroyed the power of the evil one and the powers of darkness. If you watch Christ in the Gospels, what is he doing? He is turning back the influence of Satan. He is reversing the curse. He is healing the sick. He's raising the dead. He's casting out demons. Just like he dethroned Pharaoh, he's dethroning Satan in all of his manifestations. And he purchases his people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. It's no longer just one ethnicity that is the people of God. It is people from every tribe, tongue, and nation across the earth whom he purchased. Now notice the language of the text. He didn't purchase every nation, but men from every nation. He didn't just make salvation possible. He saved us. He secured us. He purchased us by his own blood. Our assurance and our hope and our joy and our confidence does not come in how sincerely we believed. It comes in the fact that Christ is our Savior who secured our redemption by dying in our place. Jesus is now bringing us to God. He has pardoned us. Guilt is washed away in Him. Forgiveness is free in Him. Freedom from bondage and enslavement to sinful desires and impulses is real in Him. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This is the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. And this lamb, because he has taken away the sin of the world, is now worthy, authorized to open the book and execute its contents. Look at the universal worship of the lamb and God. In verses 11 through 14, we see the final image. As John is looking, he begins to hear thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of voices singing in praise to God. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. There's seven, there's seven blessings that he is worthy to receive. And what he's saying is he's worthy to receive every possible worship and blessing and honor and tribute and wealth and honor and power and glory and splendor. Everything that should be given to someone of worth is given to Jesus because he died. Can you imagine it? Can you see it? Can you, can you just imagine it for me? All of creation is swelling with this irresistible urge to sing praises to God and the Lamb. Tears are streaming down one's face. Joy is pulsating. Fists are pumping. Feet are dancing. Wings are whirring. Animals are scry crying. And the praise of the Almighty and the Lamb. Every single thing and every single being in all of creation is roaring with the praise of the Lamb and God. The sound is indescribable. The electricity in that moment is breathtaking because the Lamb has overcome evil. The Lamb has overcome suffering by submitting Himself to suffering. And now that He has conquered Satan and conquered sin and conquered death, 
He is going to unleash the final judgment so that he can make all things new. So that there will be a day that will last forever and ever and ever where there is no suffering, there is no pain, there is no tears, there is no mourning, there is no crying, there is no tragedy, there is no more separation. Everything is made new. That's the future. That's the future. That's what's going to happen. And when... when when we, think, uh, when we think of Christ, when we think of Christianity, we think far too small. We're thinking that Jesus just makes our life better in this world. Silliness and nonsense. Jesus makes all things new. And he is calling us to overcome, not to give in. Because the world in which we live we will suffer. We will be killed. We will be hurt. But just like Jesus denied himself and took up his cross to save us, we deny ourselves, take up our cross in order to bring that salvation to the world. So we cannot stand back and allow our fear to paralyze us into inaction, into inactivity, and into silence. We know the end of the story. We know Christ has triumphed. We know that all of heaven is roaring with His praise. We know Satan is wriggling underneath His feet. We know death is going to be reversed. We know sin is going to be pardoned. We know these things to be true and fact. And this community is dying and perishing and chasing sin and chasing the world, thinking that in this world there is joy. And they're trying to cling to it. They're trying to stay young. They're trying not to die. They're trying to grab as much joy in this world as they can because they have no hope that life extends beyond this. And yet we know that we can lay down every good thing in this life because the goodness of God is ours to come. And it's certainly coming. We must tell the world. We must tell the world of Christ. We must proclaim His glory and His grace and His goodness and His triumph and His death and His resurrection and His enthronement and His coming judgment. Some of us in this room are silent because we're afraid to suffer. We're tempted to compromise our convictions and our beliefs and our witness because we don't want the pain of rejection or the pain of torture or the pain of death. But I tell you the truth. How can we not burst with joy when we know what we know? It bursts and explodes our fear and empowers us to look death in the face and smile. Say, do your worst. He'll just reverse it when you're done. Jesus Christ is making all things new. We must keep bearing witness. We must keep praying for His kingdom to come. We must keep declaring Christ. So Christian, you sit here this morning. You cannot sit here silent anymore. You need to proclaim Jesus. Keep talking of Jesus. Keep praying for opportunities to expand His kingdom into the world. Dear sinner, you sit here and you've never trusted in Christ. You've never committed your life to following Christ. And you think, maybe later, but I tell you the truth, today is the day of mercy and today is the day of salvation. Don't wait. Look to Christ and be saved. Let's pray.